the first thing I just kind of want to get out of the way real quick is uh, make sure that we all have a common understanding of what refactoring is, particularly in the context of legacy code. So um, as if you were in Arlo's session earlier, he talked a little bit about this, but refactoring really is changing the design and structure perhaps of uh, existing code without altering its behavior. Okay, so it's not fixing bugs, it's not adding new features, it's not doing a whole, you know, just writing test cases is not refactoring. It's strictly about not adding new behavior, not changing the behavior of a system, okay? And improving the design in the meantime. And really the only time that you would really want to even refactor legacy code is if you were planning to change it. So if it's already out there in production, running and working, there's really no reason to go in and refactor it. Um, it doesn't really make much sense. Okay, so hopefully this doesn't keep happening. All right, so um, this talk is going to be uh, a, uh, it's gonna be dealing with a Java code base and um, it's got me doing some code, um, which is uh, uh, all part of this fabulous movie that I've put together. All right, so there's four rules of simple design. The first rule is that it passes all the tests. Second is that it reveals intent. Third, don't repeat yourself. And fourth is fewer parts. We'll be going through each one of these in the context of the refactoring. There's also one rule of legacy code refactoring, which is don't break it. So don't break it. You gotta make sure everything's working. All right, so on to the code base. So this is the overview of the code that we're gonna be looking at. This is taken from a uh, um, production system. Uh, I've stripped out some of the miscellaneous, uh, I've stripped out this part, portion of the code um, to make it consumable in this, um, in this session. Um, so first we have this custom job execution listener. Hopefully you can read this okay from back there. Um, and that's a, it's like a spring based uh, um, application. So that's a spring uh, class. Um, then there's a date time util, which as you might expect has date time utilities. And we have, that's a fairly large class. We have a file util, which anybody know what that does? File utilities, that's right. Okay, so there's, this is actually quite a really huge class. You can see here's the little scroll bar. So it's got, uh, uh, I think somewhere around 500,000 lines of code. So something like that. <clears throat> and we have one last file, which is the uh, infamous constants file, which any good project, any good legacy project at least has one of these. Um, so this is a constant file where you throw all of the constants that are used anywhere in your application. All right, so this is our legacy code base we're gonna be dealing with. We'll start with rule four of simple design, which is fewer parts. Um, one of the first things I love to do when I'm tackling legacy code bases is look for dead code. So um, in most IDEs, this is Eclipse, um, there are uh, settings for uh, it to be able to help you find dead code. So it's got things like uh, our local variables used, our parameters used, um, unused type parameters, imports, et cetera. So I generally go in and I'll make sure I enable all of these things. Um, and as a side note, all these settings that you make um, um, uh, for your particular project, uh, in my opinion, should then be shared with the team, whether via config files or however it's done, so that everybody's using the same set of, um, of configurations. So you can see that this has uh, notified us that there are 10 things that are not used. It, it ranges from import statements to um, uh, methods that are not used. Okay, so the next step is gonna be eliminate the dead code. So here we have, you know, these are just kind of basic things. Um, import, let's make sure we get rid of, get rid of things like that. Um, and we have, um, this is a method that is not used locally. So you can tell, Eclipse knows because it's a private method that's only used in this class. Um, nobody's calling it, so we can just get rid of it. Um, there's multiple ways to do it in, in, um, uh, in Eclipse. You can either hit command one or control one if you're on Windows and that's like a little quick fix, or you can click on the little thing on the sidebar and do a remove method. So there's various different ways to do it. Um, and you can also highlight multiple, um, you can select multiple uh, problems and then fix them all, fix them all at once, i.e. remove them all at once. Okay, so we're moving some local variables. Here's a local variable into i equals zero. And then inside this little loop, there's a i plus plus. So we're incrementing that counter, but it's not actually being used anywhere. So the value is being written, but never read. Um, that's a, unnecessary um, statement. And actually the JVM probably is gonna be taking that out during at uh, runtime anyway. So uh, we can get rid of that. Um, and then the last one that we have here is the value of the secondary, um, the value of the parameter is not used. So we've got a parameter here, this uh, secondary file, which is used nowhere in this method. You can't really see it, but it's, it's highlighted in yellow there. Um, and you can see right above that is where it's being called in this uh, get main CTX, blah, 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 blah. 
Um, the second parameter is just being passed in as a empty string. So Eclipse has this nice feature, change method signature, command option C, um, learn the shortcuts. Those are great shortcuts to use. Um, if you hit that, um, you'll get this little pop-up and you'll get a list of your parameters. You've got your input file name, secondary file name. We'll take that uh, secondary file, click remove, and you can notice that when it changes it, not only will the, um, the, the function be changed, but the calling location, that, that parameter will be eliminated as well. Okay? So that's a nice, nice little uh, refactoring technique. And I think that's the last one here. Okay, so that clears out all of the unused code, dead code, that Eclipse knows about. <clears throat> okay, so uh, I also like to make changes in very small little chunks. So after every little change like this, we'll commit. So get check in. <clears throat> OK. OK. So <clears throat> next, find more dead code. There's always more dead code. That's just the beginning. OK. So um, there's a great plugin for Eclipse, and I believe this is available for other tools as well, uh, called UC Detector. Um, highly recommended. It, uh, it will help you find things that Eclipse doesn't know the first thing about. So, so you can install that and then um, <clears throat> the way you use it is you just right click on the project and do the UC detector, detect unnecessary code. And it, what it'll do is it'll go through and it will find things like um, public methods and public fields that are not used anywhere in the code base, te uh, code that's only invoked by test methods, etc. Um, you have to be a little bit careful because if you have public methods, you have to make sure that those aren't being used by an outside API or something like that. Um, and like this one here, this says class custom job execution listener um, has zero references. Well, that's because it's the entry point for the code. So we're not going to obviously delete the entry point for the code. So you have to be a, pay a little more attention to what's going on here. But there are, certainly are things that, so this public constant here, it's just unused. Nobody, nobody in the code base is using it. We know this is not a public API. This is an internally used system. So we can start deleting some of this stuff. <clears throat> so this is probably my, like, this is like the best. Do you guys like deleting code? Anyone? It's like so good. I could like watch, it, watch like somebody delete code all day. It's a, I consider it kind of a net positive day if at the end of my day, my net contribution has been negative lines of code. And that's not really a joke. Like it sounds funny, but it actually is true because even when you're just doing any other types of refactoring, oftentimes you're finding abstractions and things and removing duplication and all that kind of thing. So um, it, can, it can be a really nice thing. So, um, so here again, there's a whole bunch of methods that aren't being used. We can just select them all at once and delete um, <clears throat> import statements. And, and once you have a code base that's kind of under control like this and doesn't have all of these things, you can actually set up your editors to automatically fix the imports and automatically um, fla flag you and let you know when you're introducing unused fields and so on. So um, <clears throat> there's another, uh, uh, another one, okay. And oftentimes what you'll see happening is as you start deleting code, more dead code will start appearing because the code that, there's now additional code that was being used only by the things that you had just deleted. So you kind of have to keep going in this cycle until you've hit everything. So um, I believe that's what I'm doing here, it's a little bit of that. Um, and unfortunately, this particular tool, this code detector, uh, UC code detector, um, leaves a bunch of uh, white space in your code, so you just reformat it and it fixes it, but um, that takes care of that, okay. Um, some of these are flagged because it's suggesting that you should change them to package level rather than public. I tend not to pay too much attention to those, but uh, it just depends on what your tolerance is. Okay, one other field. Okay, I think that's the last one. All right, all right, make sure we check in. First time I did this, it was live and it took way longer because I didn't have the ability to fast forward myself. So that was problematic. Okay. All right. Come on, type faster. Okay. Our next step, we're uh, going to detect unnecessary code again. So this is just going to go through that same thing, uh, just kind of what I was talking about. You have these uh, methods that are now now, since the other code is, is gone, now no longer have any references. So go through and get rid of those. This should happen pretty quickly, I think. Delete code. 
So in, in this one, what I've basically been doing here is highlighting them, uh, hitting Command-1 or Control-1, and then um, hitting OK. OK, delete, delete, delete. So in this, this whole presentation is compressed down into about uh, 43 minutes or so. Um, and um, the actual time that it took me to do all of this refactoring was maybe on the order of, uh, I don't know, like an hour and a half or two hours. So um, uh, it's not, it's, you know, it doesn't really take that much time, so it's, it's worth doing. <clears throat> and again, remember that we are, we are not changing the behavior. So all these things that we're doing are completely safe. Okay? That was me overzealously deleting. I actually deleted something and uh, in introduced a uh, uh, error, compile error. Okay. There we go. Okay, reformat it again, and now we're good. So remember, if you remember that constants file, it used to be really quite enormous, and now it's uh, now it's only a few lines. Okay. <clears throat> Check that one in. Very nice comments. Very doing a real good job there. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So uh, the next thing we want to do is remove unneeded classes. So this is again part of the minimizing moving parts. Okay. Um, so we have this class, the constants class, um, and it has this field called blank, um, which is used in the custom job executioner listener. Uh, class. We also have these default processing file path and so on. They're also only used in the custom execution listener. Um, we've got the split regex, which is used only in the file util class, and we've got the unknown um, uh, constant that's only used in the, get er, in the file util as well. So what we can do is we can move members, and um, we just type a location for where we want to move it, and we can move the code or the uh, the um, that constant into the location where it's actually being used. So that way we're, we're kind of getting better encapsulation and things like that. We're not, we're not leaking um, abstractions outside of our classes. Okay, so we'll do the same thing with these other, other um, uh, constants. It makes you wonder why they were put in a constants class. Sometimes people put them things there just because they are constants and therefore belong in a constants class. I don't know. Who knows why it's there? It's there. So we fixed it. Um, and now things are back to where they should be. You know, they're back to the, where they belong. Um, and now we have this empty constants interface and we can get rid of it. So yay, yay for us. Okay, we have one less class, um, and we've actually made the code clearer in the process of doing that. Okay, uh, you can see here these are the uh, these are the uh, moved variables, and probably I, what I didn't do, but I probably would do, is make these private at this point. But um, that's another little thing that you could do. All right, and these are the ones that we moved to file util. Okay, all right, so I'll check in that code. I believe the next check-in I actually fast forward so it'll go it'll go faster. Okay. So there's the constants class checked in. Okay, we're gonna go to rule two now, which is reveal intent. Um, and this is uh, rule two, simple design. We're gonna talk about comments. Um, everybody love comments? Everyone's favorite thing? Okay. A lot of times comments lie. We have this thing up here that says this resource of SOD supports out of bound file operations. So let's take a look at this class. Um, anybody no, notice anything about a resource facade? I don't really even know what a resource facade is, but I don't see anything about it here. Um, and I don't know, really know what out of bound, out of bound file oper outbound file operations? I guess operations are going somewhere, I don't know. It doesn't seem to be adding any value, so we just delete it. Um, these author tags that are rampant throughout Java, we have source control these days. It's a relatively new invention, but it keeps track of who made changes to code. And um, you, can, uh, you can just delete that. We also don't need things that tell us that things are constructors, for example, um, those types of comments. Um, and I find that a lot of times these types of comments get into code bases because they, um, you know, pause it for a second, um, they get into code bases because people have made uh, settings on their IDE that are enforcing you to put java.comments and things like that. Get rid of those things. You only need comments if you really, really are having a hard time uh, explaining the, the, the uh, intent of your methods or variables. And if you're really having trouble explaining the intent of your methods or variables, maybe you should work on, the, on 
revealing the intent of your methods or variables rather than adding a comment. So um, with the exception of public APIs. Okay, continue. All right, so in this case, we have a comment here that says this method gets the CTX main file name for the split file name. It has a parameter called name, which is a file name, and it has a return, returns a file name. Um, not super helpful. Again, this looks like a, maybe an automatically generated thing or something, um, but it's, it is not really adding a lot of value. Um, and in addition, it says gets the CTX main file name. This thing says setup file is the name of the method. There's some sort of disconnect there, but those uh, Java doc, the, the param things we can get rid of, those weren't really adding anything whatsoever. And if that's what this method is supposed to be doing, assuming that it's correct, um, I don't know if it's correct, but let's assume that it's correct, um, then it would be better for us to simply rename this to be what the comment says. Um, and this is gonna be arguably a pretty poor name for a method, but it's a better name than setup file. Okay, so we're gonna call this instead get, uh, retrieve CTX main file name from the split file name. Okay, so it's long, but you know, luckily we have a lot of bits these days, so we can, you know, we can uh, have long file names. And this is a good, when we look at this later on, we'll say, that looks like a terrible file name. Let me think about what this does uh, in more specificity, and we'll probably come up with a better name. But this is better than setup file, okay? So we'll fix that. Okay, so we wanna make sure, so revealing intent, that's what this, this is all about. So comments, comments are often uh, disguisers, of, disguisers of intent and do not really reveal intent. Okay. Uh, rename vigorously. Um, unfortunately, in this section, I don't really rename vigorously, but I'm trying to tell you you should rename vigorously. Um, so renaming is great. So we've got this, method, there, this variable here called p path, and we have another one called proc date. It appears that it's getting the string called processing file path. So why don't we just call the variable processing file path? Again, this whole thing about you know uh, single character abbreviations and things like that. We have plenty of bits, so let's let's use them. Um, processing file path. Uh, is a good name, or a decent name. Um, this next one is proc date. Uh, again, this is process date. Why did we abbreviate it to proc? I don't know. So uh, let's call it process date. And when we do things like this, what we start noticing is that we have one field here called processing file path. The other one is called process date. Why aren't they both processing, or why aren't they both process? There's something weird there. I don't exactly know what it is, but it makes it more obvious that there's some sort of um, discrepancy, and maybe it's something we should look at later on. Um, so that's the extent of rename vigorously. Clearly, I should have done more. <clears throat> so uh, rename, rename, renaming is a good, really easy, safe, fast um, thing to do. All right. So um, what was the second call? What's that? Oh, extract method. Okay. Thank you. All right. So we're extracting methods here. So we have this section of code. Uh, this is a very long method. Um, well, not, I mean, it just depends on your context, I suppose. But uh, in this code base, it's a long method, and uh, what I like to do is try to get methods to a minimum of, at least it should fit on a screen, okay? If it doesn't fit on a screen, it's too, way too big. So um, there's this whole section of code in the middle here that's all about getting the log file name. So what we're gonna do is just highlight this whole thing, and this is another great shortcut to remember if you're using whatever ID you use. Um, uh, in Eclipse, it's uh, command option uh, M for extract, okay? <clears throat> so pointing out the uh, comment or the uh, shortcut. Uh, we hit that and then it, all you do is you just type in the new method name what you want it to be called. In this case we're going to call it setup log file and notice that it has all the parameters that it's going to need. It'll set it up properly and there'll be no, you know, it'll again a perfectly safe safe thing to do. All right, so now we have this little log file name equals setup log file and it passes in some parameters. Um, we now can fit our method at least on one page. It's still not great but um, Let's see if we can do a little better. There seems to be this whole section of code right here, which is dealing with this file, move, file util move. It's doing uh, something about moving the, moving the files around. So let's call this method file, uh, move files. So we did command option M again, and away we go. <clears throat> All right, so now we have a section that's moving the files. It's getting a little bit better, a um, little bit more manageable. We can look at this and say, okay, well, if we need to figure out where files moved, we can go in there and do it. If we need to find out about the file name, we can go to the other method, and so on. All right, so rule number one is all about passes all tests. And um, here we're gonna be talking about characterization tests. So characterization tests are meant to capture the behavior of code. This is not about 
test driving. This is not about finding bugs or anything like that. Here, I'm just moving a method to make, put it in the right spot because it was out of order. Um, but uh, this, is, this is simply about capturing the behavior of, of existing code. Um, it might reveal to us that there's a bug in it, but that is not our concern right now because we're not changing the behavior of the code. Okay, so we're gonna write some characterization tests. In order to write characterization tests or tests of any kind, it's often the case where you have to change um, the, um, uh, the scope of the method. So in this case, I removed the private uh, notation on there. If you were test driving this code, obviously you wouldn't need to do that um, because you would only be testing public methods. <coughs> All right, so we're gonna create a test class and we have our first test class here using JUnit. Um, first thing we're going to test is this first line here, log file name, um, and there's a condition here where it's testing for the blankness of the file path that was passed in. So let's call this first test, well, we want to know what happens if you pass in a blank file name, uh, or a file, blank file pass, path, I don't know. All right, so the first thing we do, uh, whenever you write a new test, in my opinion, you write, write it and run it. Just run it, make sure you're act it's actually failing. You don't want to get into a state where you've written a bunch of code and then uh, realize it's passing, but you're actually running the wrong test. So verify that it fails, so you're running the right thing. <clears throat> okay, first thing we have is creating this custom job execution or listener instance. This is the method that we're testing, and then we have an assertion after that. So all tests generally have three sets, arrange, act, and assert. Um, this, uh, this method takes uh, four parameters, so we're gonna uh, pull out some variables for those. Um, and here I'm just using command one to generate the variable. Um, declarations. All right. Okay, so we've got a variable here now called uh, log file. And what do we want to know? Um, we want to assert that the uh, log file um, is, has some value. And we don't know what the value is. We don't really care what the value is. We want to run the test to find out what the value is, and then we'll just encode that here, okay? So we don't need to worry too much about figuring out what the assert is at this point. Um, there's also this section down here about MDC, which is a logging uh, terminology for map diagnostic context, something specific for logging. Don't have to worry about it too much, but we're also gonna just uh, write a test for that to make sure that MDC is set properly. <clears throat> okay, so we'll say MDC, and we'll again leave the, leave the assertion blank. All right. So what should these parameters going in here be? So we've got, we're gonna start out with kind of the simplest thing possible. We'll just put in some dummy values and see what happens. So we'll just put nulls and base cases here. All right, so we got a null pointer exception. Clearly that's not what the code is supposed to do. Um, so let's see where we're getting the null pointer exception. And it appears to be that this uh, job execution um, thing is null. So we need to give that job execution a value. And in order to do that, um, so this is a Spring class, this job execution. Um, if anybody's dealt with Spring, you know, I love Spring as much as the next person, but sometimes it's hard to deal with. So a good way to deal with it, particularly on legacy code bases, is to create mocks. So any, anybody not familiar with mocks? Okay, all right, so basically all we're saying here is this is a fake class. We're, the, we're gonna take this job execution class and just create a fake instance of it that can do our bidding. Um, so we, what we wanted to do is that when we call this get job instance method, we want it to return us a, a canned value, okay? So we're gonna say when we call job execution, showing my excellent typing skills. Okay, when job execution dot um, get job instance. There it is, all right. So when, when I call that method, um, what I want it to return is um, something. What is it supposed to return? It's supposed to return some job parameters. Or no, it's supposed to return a job instance. There we go. All right, so again, we need a variable of job instance. And um, by the way, if this seems kind of tedious, it is. And this is kind of what happens when you're dealing with legacy code. If you were doing, if you were TDDing this code, then this type of thing generally doesn't happen. Okay, so we have a job instance class. Same thing here, we've got, um, uh, we need to call the get uh, job name on that and we want to get a canned value back. So we're gonna create this as a mock as well. We've got a job instance there. Uh, we'll set up an expectation here where when we call the job instance get job name, then it will return us some name. And um, everyone knows the best job name is Fred. So <clears throat> there it is. Okay, so we've got a job name. So hopefully now we're gonna run this test and see what kind of value pops out, which is gonna be some sort of really great log file um, name. So there we go, let's run it. All 
OK. All right, so we run it, and you can see the expectation down here. It's a little hard to see, but basically it says Fred 2015-10-10. Uh, uh, um, arguably a pretty bad name for a log file, but uh, that's what it is. And again, we're not here to change the behavior of the system and make it a better file name. We just want to capture how it's actually working. Okay. All right. And uh, keep in mind that, remember, the goal of this refactoring is to uh, make our code ready for modification. Okay? So we're getting, getting to the point where we want to be able to modify the code, because doing that without these types of tests uh, can be hazardous. Um, so we've got this. We're testing also now the map diagnostic context. As it turns out, they're the same, the same value. Okay. So how do we know what to test next? Um, a good way to do that is using code coverage on legacy code bases. Um, Eclipse, again, has a plugin called Echolemma um, that you can uh, install. And uh, um, it's, uh, Emma is the name of the, uh, the Java code coverage um, dealy, and it's got plugins for pretty much everything, or you can even run it command line. Okay, so that's a great tool. So install that. And then um, instead of running it normally, you run it through via the code coverage tool. And, um, you'll get a diff little different output. So what it'll show you is uh, highlighted in green, which is probably hard for you to see. Highlighted in green is all the code that's actually been executed. In this case, since the test ran, the test was executed. And highlighted in blue, or sorry, highlighted in yellow um, are lines that have only been partially executed because this is a, a ternary operator here, so it's only one of the branches in that line was executed. And red means it hasn't been executed at all. So that can be a good indicator as to uh, what types of things we should test next. So let's uh, quickly check this guy in. <clears throat> Got our first test in there. Yay, characterization test. Okay, move on to rule three, which is don't repeat yourself. Um, and the way we're going to show that is through more characterization tests. Okay, so we've done blank file path. And as you probably can guess, the next uh, obvious test would be a non-blank file path. So let's just start by copying this test and create a new one here, and this will be called um, non-blank file path. Okay. There we go. Okay, so uh, here we've got the file path being passed in, so instead of passing in a blank string, we'll just pass in something else. We'll call it blah.txt. And we'll run this and see what happens. Again, we don't care what the results are we just want to capture the behavior. All right, so in this case, apparently if you pa pass in a file path, it just uses that, the file name as the log file name, okay? So, okay, so we'll put blah text there and run it again. And it looks like the, um, the map diagnostic context also is going to be uh, blah.txt. So set both of those values, okay. So now we've got another characterization test. And um, remember that this section is headed under the uh, don't repeat yourself um, uh, rule of simple design. So, uh, well, the first thing we can notice here is that this line is now green. Um, doesn't look green over there, but it, it is green. And um, uh, so that means that we've covered all the branches on that line. Okay, so now we've got these two tests where we're repeating a fair amount of information. And if you went to uh, Gerard's talk this morning, he talked about writing good unit tests. Um, and uh, one, of the, one of the things he was talking about is making sure that you are, your test, it's obvious within your test what the important pieces are. So in this right now, there's a whole bunch of stuff in there. We can't really tell what's the significant portion of that uh, test. So we're going to move some of the common things up to the setup method. Um, and there we go. Move that. Anything that's duplicated, we'll just move it up there. Convert some of these variables to fields. Again, that's another uh, Eclipse quick fix. You just hit com Command-1 and say convert to field, and it will do it for you. OK. So those guys are um, uh, common now. Looks like the uh, Eclipse is trying to catch up to my rapid editing. OK. This is a very old computer. It's, it's yeah, got to be nice to it. OK. Um, all right, so, uh, so now that we've uh, moved some of that stuff into the common method, we can take it out of the second method as well, or the second test. And there we go. 
So we've gotten out some of the common stuff. So now it becomes a little more obvious. It's still not perfect, but we can see, you know, it's a little bit easier to see that, okay, the difference between this and this is this line here that says file path. Um, I believe a little later on that I'm going to move some more stuff out of there as well. Okay. All right. So there are two things. Okay. So we also have this uh, assertion here. Um, which is fairly common between these two methods. And the only difference, the unique part about it is this, the actual value, so that FRED 2015 uh, value. So this is a fairly common pattern when you're extracting methods. And what you want to do is find the common, or the unique part of the section that you want to extract and pull that out as a local variable, okay? So first we pull that out like that. So we'll call that the expected file name um, because we want to be able to make something that, where we can pass in an expected file name. Uh, the next thing to do is uh, select the code that you want to extract. And then using our handy dandy extract method, we just extract it. And you can see that any of the parameters that it needed, including this thing here, expected file name, are now, are now a parameter. If we had not extracted this expected file name first, then that whole Fred thing would be in, it would have been inside this method, which is not really what we want. We wanted that to be a parameter. Okay? And then once we've done that, we can then go back to expected file name and inline it back in, because there's really no reason for it to be a separate, um, uh, a separate variable. So now we have a cert log file, and it's just, it's just right there. So that's a pretty common pattern. Extract the local variables, extract the method, and then re-inline. Okay? Now we can use that same method in the other, uh, that same assertion in the, sa in the, the non-blank file path. Yeah. <coughs> Okay, so the don't repeat yourself applies to tests as well as, as, uh, as code, um, as production code. Okay, so there's our little assertion. Very nice. Okay, and I think, there we go, we're gonna run our code cover, or just run it again, make sure it still works. Every time you make a change to a test, uh, it's a good idea to, to run it. Um, uh, the other thing is it's also a very nice idea to, to, um, to um, uh, get a shortcut for your running of tests so that you can just rapidly run them so you don't have to keep using the menu options and so on. All right. So our next test that we're going to write uh, is okay. Okay. This one is going to be about the um, about the agency. So if you saw that uh, that line up there, it had a, uh, uh, the job name that was coming in was uh, call about the agency debt extract. So it behaves differently when that agency debt, debt extract has, um, uh, is the value, okay? So we're gonna go ahead and run this again and see what the file name should be. Okay, that's another uh, compilation error. There we go. All right, so we run this guy and let's see what we get. Okay, so this time um, it gives us a kind of a cryptic ar uh, error, unfortunately. It says something about the illegal argument exception, the partial must not be null or something. Um, basically, this is a problem, uh, error in the date time utilities of, uh, that it's using, but we'll kind of gloss over that. And suffice it to say, this job parameters get date thing is returning us a null value, and that's what we need to fix. So when we call job parameters dot get date, we need to make sure that it gives us a, um, a good value. Um, and um, in this case, we're going to try and set that value. So when we, we take a look at our job parameters, we want to set that value in there. Um, and look, there's no set method, so there's no way to set a date. Um, so it looks like this is some sort of a map. Um, so we'll get the parameters, so we'll get that map, and then maybe we can add, uh, set a value on that. Um, and it appears that there's no way to set a value, or there, you, can put, you can put the date, um, but uh, you need to supply it a uh, parameter, which is a job parameter object. Um, unfortunately, job parameter object is also this uh, kind of crazy spring batch thing. Um, it's starting to get a little more complicated than we like, and we don't really, we don't, again, care about how do you set up job parameters and all that. That's way outside of the scope of this test. So we're just going to um, uh, make this into a mock, this job parameters thing, and just simplify the whole, um, whole thing. All right, so we have our job parameters mock now, and now we can uh, uh, set a value on it real easily. 
there we go. So when we have a job parameters and <coughs> we call get date on that, uh, on that particular key, then we want it to give us back um, a, um, I think it's a, it's a Joda time local date or something like that. So, okay. And we're having it return us this 2015-10-10. If I was doing this again, I probably would give it a different value because we're already using this 2015-10-10. So there's possibility of some sort of, uh, 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 we're not, that we're not capturing some behavior that we want by, not, by using that same value, okay? All right, so we've got that uh, job parameters thing set and we'll run our test again, see if that fixed it. Okay, and um, it says, okay, so it says the, the value should be agency debt extract null 2015-10-10. Probably, again, not exactly what we meant. There's probably not supposed to be a null in that thing, so let's see where that came from. Um, the null comes from apparently this, uh, again, it's another job parameters thing where we're trying to get this agency ID out of the job parameters. So, um, uh, yeah, so here we go. So I'm not in love with mocks. I don't think they're the greatest thing ever. Um, but uh, this is a great situation to be using them in um, when we're trying not to, not to modify our design or to, to modify the production code. Okay, so uh, we made that agency ID return ABC and then that apparently becomes part of the log file name. So now it says agency debt extract ABC 2015 10.10 and we have a passing, passing test. And as it turns out, the MDC is still the same. So our, that assertion ex extract that we did um, worked out just fine. Okay. So we run our code coverage again. Now you can see that these first two blocks have actually been covered. Okay, so we've got that first one and then the first if statement also has been covered. Um, and I believe we're gonna do, uh, okay, so now we're gonna talk about uh, refactoring tests as well. So we have in here um, the file path and process date. Um, again, we, these, these seem to be essentially the same for all of these methods. This file path we're not changing, the process date we're not changing, with the exception of that very first test um, where we're setting the file path to null, okay? So we can go ahead and move these values up to the, um, the setup method, get rid of some of that duplication. Okay, and then only in the case of this first one where we have a uh, blank file path, we'll leave that uh, essentially uh, setting a new file path locally for that, for that test. But the other ones don't, no longer need it. Okay, so that, uh, again, makes it a little bit clearer as to what exactly the test is doing. So it went from fa a fairly long method to, it's now just a three, three line arrange act assert. Um, <coughs> all right, um, so again, now before we, we're, our goal here is to be able to change that, uh, that method, or change that method, to actually change the behavior of the method. And so in order to do that, we wanna make sure that we get full code coverage on the method, okay? So we're just going through here and essentially uh, doing the same type of tests for all of these uh, things, same process, checking the, checking the output um, of the test and then changing the assertion to match whatever the output came to be. Um, we'll go through that for all of these. Uh, should just take another minute here. And, um, the other thing to recognize when you're writing these characterization tests is that while it will give you a good degree of confidence that you haven't broken something when you actually go to change the behavior, it's not a guarantee because you're not testing every combination of everything. You're not testing, you know, um, possibly like all the error conditions that could come up. There's a whole, a whole bunch of things that we're not testing. So, um, so that's just something to keep in mind this, that it's not 100% it's not reliable, but you are gonna get pretty darn close and a lot better, uh, you're gonna be in a lot better state than you would be if you had no tests around it. Okay, <clears throat> significantly better state. Okay, and okay, so we'll run this. I think we're at the point where we have all of the uh, code covered. Okay, we've got all our tests, eight tests, and it looks like, there it is. So okay, so all of the code has been covered. Okay, so now we're in a place where we are ready to actually make a change to this code if we um, feel like it. Um, and uh, so now we're gonna safely refactor. Okay, so we'll do, we'll do just do a couple small refactorings here. Um, the first thing is that we can notice that, uh, okay, apparently I felt the need to run the test again, you know. 
Okay, so we can see that uh, um, we've got this not here. That's kind of weird. So we just invert that so that we start with a non-negative condition. It just makes things easier to read rather than having to read not. You can just check if it's blank. It makes a little more sense. Um, we've got all of these, uh, um, all these if statements have this log, logging thing at the end. Um, so let's take that out and we'll put it at the bottom. Now this is a behavioral change because there is one condition where if it didn't meet any of these conditions, um, it actually w will still log in this case, whereas um, before our change, it would not log that if, if none of those conditions match. So we have actually introduced a behavior change now, but the important stuff about the MDC and the log file name, um, we've already captured. So hopefully that behavior will not get ruined. Um, we're also going to now extract this, uh, that little block of code, which is all about specifically getting, uh, generating that file name. Um, so we're going to uh, pull that out into a smaller method. <clears throat> okay. And Okay, and so now we have this little setup log file uh, thing now is uh, fairly easy. All we, uh, we're just getting the file name and then setting up the diagnostic context and that's pretty much it. Okay, very, very straightforward. All right, so this generate log file name is uh, it's kind of weird. You know, we've got a bunch of if conditions. Obviously only one of these things is ever gonna match. It's checking the same variable every time. Um, there's really no need for it to do that. Um, so let's uh, convert that to be uh, if else's instead. Um, save us some ex execution paths, um, <clears throat> okay? And then um, if you look at the very first line, I think that's the next thing I'm doing here. Uh, okay, so we'll run it. Make sure that still works, okay? All of our ver values are still uh, the same. Um, this log file name, it's being set at the very beginning and then it's being potentially overridden. Um, essentially what that means is this is the default value. So we're gonna move that to the end and uh, we just put that in the last else statement. Uh, makes it a little bit easier to read. And then also now, now that it's in this else statement, we have you know, all these if else's and then we have a ternary operator in the middle of an else. So that's kind of weird. So we'll break that back out into a, um, uh, a regular uh, if else. Okay. So again, Eclipse has little uh, things that'll do that for you. It'll replace a ternary with a if else. Okay. So we can do that. And and the, so the cha changes like that to me feel more scary than than like the rename refactors and things like that. So I always want to make sure that I have really good coverage before doing doing things like this. Okay. All right. So there's that, and then we've got uh, I believe just two small changes left. Um, I was just going to tell him you should run the tests. Good thing. Okay, so um, you can see here now we've got this log file variable, a uh, log file name. We're setting that everywhere and then returning it at the end. Um, I'm just going to replace that with just a return um, uh, everywhere. Some people object to this kind of thing because you're interrupting the control flow. Um, I think it's fine as long as you have short methods. When you have really long methods, um, uh, this is problematic. Um, I'm out of time, but I literally have half a minute left, so I'm going to keep going. And um, uh, the, other, the other thing that you get out of this is that you now have an immutable variable. You don't have that variable that you keep changing log file uh, over and over again. Uh, and immutability is probably a, a good topic for another talk, but uh, it's a good thing, suffice it to say. So we have that. And then um, I believe the last thing I'm going to change here, um, you can see this, uh, there's all sorts of duplication here, this uh, uh, job execution, got, get job instance, get job name. That whole thing is just repeated over and over again. So we're just going to extract that out into a local variable and it will replace um, everywhere at once. And I think that was the last change I'm going to make for now. But <clears throat> um, the idea then is that you can now get in there and at least with this, th that method change fairly willy nilly and um, uh, it should, it should uh, uh, refactor it in non IDE ways that you may not expect or may not know whether uh, with 100% confidence that they're safe, but you can now do it with, with um, some confidence. And I think I'm just going to check in here. That would be a good idea. All right, so that's it. I'm checking those guys in, and uh, that's, that's the end of that part. So I think I still have like probably a minute for um, one minute. One minute. All right, so one minute for uh, any questions. Or I'll let you go a minute early. Yeah. I'm also a big fan of deleting codes, yes. but the way you did it without any kind of test first, that, mm -hmm. that leaves me a bit uncomfortable. 
So the, deleting the code without the tests made you feel uncomfortable. So um, it depends on what you're doing. So I, I, you know, in the case where there are you know, uh, private methods that are not invoked anywhere, it doesn't matter. I mean, there's no test for it. So I mean, what are you going to test? You're going to test that you call it, and your test would call it, but nobody else calls it. So you, I mean, it's the, I'm not sure what you would do, so uh, or how you would test that. So those are okay to delete. Same with same with private any, anything private that's not used anywhere else um, is fine to delete. And again, as long as you're not dealing with public APIs or public uh, I mean, anything that's publicly exposed outside of your universe, um, and you have you have control all, over all of it, then you can delete. So I don't, it, it does seem a little scary at first, but it's not, I don't think. All right, now I think that's my official end time. I'll be around here for a little while and then catch me anytime later if you wanna, wanna chat. I'll be here all day tomorrow. All right, thanks very much.